uh, today I get to talk to Vance Martin and Tim Haas. Now, Vance is the president of the Wild Foundation, and currently he's in Beijing, China. Uh, he's working with the mm -hmm. Chinese government to promote the concept of wilderness and also to work with them in their new policy of eco-civilization. And Tim is a board member of the Lorians, uh, the Lorian Association, and a trustee of the Wild Foundation. And Tim, you've been working with um, uh, Vance for the last 10 years for Wild, helping them with uh, non-physical allies and supporting them in that way. Is that right? That's correct. Mm -hmm. So once again, today we're going to be talking about just that, co-creative spirituality, working with uh, the subtle and the spiritual beings that are also part of our world's uh, ecosystems. Uh, the first question I'd, ask, uh, I'd like to ask, and I'll direct this at you first, Vance, I guess, is uh, how did you first get interested in the, the subtle worlds, the non-physical worlds? Well, the... <sighs> A lot of it has to do with fascination. Um, I, I equate fascination and love with the same thing, the with the subtle worlds. I don't think there's any any difference that if you're if you're fascinated with life and you're and you you have a free flow of love with life and curiosity, then you are working with the inner worlds. Um, so that's always been uh, a part of my life. Um, I, I'm not a great, uh, you know, I, I studied all the esoteric stuff, um, but quite honestly, um, when it really popped through was uh, when I began my explorations with rare and exotic herbs in the late 60s, mm. um, came very present. Um, and though that phase didn't last, a hugely long time, that exploration of my uh, inner self through those means um, made a, a significant difference. Uh, um, and then as Alan Watts said, I knew when to hang up the phone and, uh, and it, it moved on from that point. So uh, Vance, how did you first get interested in the, in the subtle worlds or the non-physical worlds? Um, I, I never saw myself uh, as much of a psychic or anything like that. I'm a pretty normal guy. And, um, I, but as I grew and I became interested in, you know, this, the internal spirit, it always seemed to make sense to me because I was always so fascinated with nature. And it just seemed to me that there was nature we could see and nature that we couldn't see. It, and, and so I had a fascination and a, and, a, uh, and a love of nature. And that was my bridge because uh, I regard fascination and love as essentially working with inner beings. Uh, I, I, I don't believe necessarily one has to distinguish, name, categorize, uh, Etc. You, you can if that means something to you, but it's not something that I particularly do. Anyhow, so that that's how I, my life has always been, and uh, and then in the late '60s, it took a little um, boost from external factors, rare and exotic herbs and psychedelics, and and suddenly that fascination and love be, became uh, very very different and and very accessible. Um, that that phase didn't last a long time, but it has stayed with me and grown ever since. So um, the doors of perception uh, were much more flung open at that time. And um, as Alan Watts said, I knew when to hang up the phone and uh, I've just kept moving. And I've had the, the very good fortune of being with people like Timothy and David and, and many, uh, many others who have helped um, me refine that sense. Nice, thank you. Timothy, what about you? How did you first get interested in, in the subtle worlds? Um, well, I had a lot of mystical experiences growing up, and so I was pretty much aware of um, internal worlds. There's a difference between internal and then subtle worlds, because internal is more of your own um, inner alignment with your soul and mystical type things. So that was what I had growing up, a lot of that, and then some subtle stuff. Um, and then, but I was really into um, sports, um, 
did a sport called modern pentathlon and then I also ended up playing rugby um and so and I was a partier and so I was all into that and then um in my early 20s this being kind of appeared in front of me and kind of said um you know basically it didn't really say anything but it just the presence kind of said okay enough of this time to get going and start focusing and so that was when I really um consciously started um you know doing arcane studies empiric studies and really consciously um, doing my meditation on a regular basis and then ultimately led that led to me to Finhorn as well so um, that was what started it in a sense well I mean it was there all along but then it kind of really got kicked into gear at that moment yeah thank you mm -hmm. yeah. so can you tell me Vance uh, just maybe uh, you could walk me through a time when working with the subtle world made a real difference in what you were doing in a project, let's say. Sure. Uh, these are some stories that Timothy and I um, have shared over the years. I have to say that um, um, you know, I was at Fintorn for 10 years and it, 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 it made an indelible you know, it was my graduate work and uh, made an indelible mark on my life uh, and uh, uh, for the better. And, um, um, but leaving uh, the Fentorn Foundation and, and taking on this work in the conservation field, um, I was very uh, self-conscious because uh, I was returning to the states where I hadn't been in, in quite a long time, not just the 10 years at Fentorn, but many years before that on the road. And um, so I kind of went underground quite purposefully because uh, the spiritual word in the concert, in the, in, in the environmental sector uh, back in, you know, in the eighties, um, you know, was still the S word, you know, you really didn't talk about it and all of that. And I had responsibility to build staff, to raise budget, to try to take this, this, this inner work into the conservation mainstream that I, you know, I, I really had never been in. <laughs> so, so I thought I'd better, uh, be a little bit careful because people like to put you in boxes. So I was not only an English major who had never studied science or ecology, I had been to spiritual communities and all that kind of stuff. So that would have sealed my fate pretty quickly in the in institutional world um, 30 or 40 years ago. So um, I, I sort of went underground and um, uh, this is all as, as a matter of background to say that um, um, uh, a lot of the work that I did in the early days, I did kind of fumbling around on my own as I created, helped to create this organization. And um, it, it, really be, uh, um, it really was lonely, actually. And, um, uh, and then suddenly there was at a certain time, you know, life life changes and I was beginning to feel that I needed to come out of the closet a little bit. Um, Timothy moved to Boulder where, where we were based and you know he and I had been together at Fintorn and all that and suddenly life presented an opportunity to do things differently. And, and I struggled a little bit to come out of that closet where I had put myself and um, but it was through Timothy's help and getting back together, spending more time with the Lorians and, and coming back to Fintorn a couple of times. And um, then suddenly it was just apparent that we had an opportunity to, to use the work that I was doing as a more conscious laboratory. And uh, so that's what we started to, to do. And there's been a, a lot of experiences, but I, I will say that one kind of stands out and, and you know, the, we, we do these very large gatherings 
world wilderness congresses and and um, they're always very fraught with challenges and financial issues and security issues and political issues and they've achieved very great things far beyond an organization our size should have any right to do um, but yet since working with Timothy and beginning to put some conscious direction into our allies and even identification, um, there was a very noticeable shift. And, and I could observe that shift in, um, in the people that I work with and their reactions to the work that we were doing, you know, the outer conservation work. People's attitudes changed. Um, their willingness to cooperate changed. Um, the, uh, the synergy increased. And there's a lot of specific examples, but I'll say in general, that that's what I noticed, that once we began to, we took that step through the doorway and Timothy and I realized we had an opportunity to work in this kind of applied manner. Um, the, the way I could see the change was the synergy with people that I worked with, often under very trying, challenging situations. Mm -hmm. Sorry for the long answer, but... That's fine, that's interesting. Uh, Timothy, I'm wondering if you could tell us a bit more about what actually you were doing differently. Uh, Vance mentioned identification and he identified a more, I guess, purposeful approach. So could you talk a little bit about what you guys were doing that made the changes? Um, hmm. Yeah, some of this we will cover a lot in the, when we do the, um, at the gathering and specifically examples and stuff like that. Um, I can give you an example of how it applied for me that led into the wild, which I think would be a good example. Um, is, you know, after Finhorn and I, um, lived in Madison and I went back to school and ended up being, um, being a psychologist for an outpatient psychiatric unit for 23 years um, and working with uh, persons with severe mental illness and schizophrenia and things. Um, and I applied things there, but then um, I finally got kind of tired of that. Our daughters wanted us to move to, to Boulder or actually to, to Colorado. And so we did. And at that point, then I decided to do a 180 and, and ended up starting to work for a, um, a local, well, it's actually national now, but it's, a, um, it's a, basically a, a um, healthy grocery store. And I started, got a job in the dairy department. And so I've been working with David all these years. And so I th thought, how can I apply what I've learned um, to this new position that I have? And so I thought about it and I thought, well, if everything has a consciousness, um, a sentience, um, then um, when people go on dairy, pilgrimages, why couldn't I set up a place for pilgrimage for the dairy product? And so that's what I did is basically I started to, um, you know, work with the loads that came in and I started to work with the product and honoring it and blessing it and then, you know, working with it in love and stocking it in, in the same way. And what I started to notice was, um, like Vance was talking about, the difference in the people. So the people, you know, this... The dairy, the dairy department was right in the line from where you went to the bathroom, to the, to the restrooms, and it was a major traffic area. And, it, and when I first started working there, it was kind of really kind of antagonistic energy a little bit. Um, people would, you know, and they, people started to be much nicer, and they're much, you know, very friendly, and they started to hang out in the dairy department. And then this really unusual thing happened is this was back in 2000, early 2009, which is during the economic downturn. And at this point, the store had 36 stores. Um, they now have a lot more. Um, and they noticed that the dairy department, our dairy department, was the only department in all 36 stores, not only just in our, our store, but all 36 stores that was making a profit. And so all the corporate people came and said, you know, like, what's going on here and everything. And I basically said, I have no idea, you know, because I didn't want to. <laughs> it wasn't about making money. It was about... Um, you know, creating an atmosphere and things like that. 
And ultimately over the years, the images continued with that. I ended up working there for almost nine years. And um, it was interesting because there was a woman who, um, when I stopped and gave my notice, she came up to me and she said, and this was a woman who was very conservative. Her husband was a conservative minister. You know, she was a Trump supporter. I mean, she was, and she said, you know, when you first came, there was, it was kind of a lot of intensity and anger between our the staff. And she said, now it's like heaven. And I really appreciate what you did. And so she noticed that And you know, there's here's someone, you know, wouldn't expect to notice what was going on. Um, and there was just a lot of people that came up to me and would say, you know, what are you doing here? Cause there's something that's shifted. That's an excellent example of how we applied it. Um, I applied it in just a, you know, a, an everyday instance. And then we ultimately graduated from there into working with WILD in terms of the International Congress and some different things like that. Yeah, great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, you're right. We'll talk more in the conference about what specifically you guys are doing. Uh, I love your stories. I think that they are uh, kind of life-changing just to hear about, really. Um, I think the last question I'd like to talk about, though, is uh, we've touched on the theme, I noticed at several points in this interview, the theme of how much can we say openly about you know, our work with the subtle worlds? It's, is it acceptable? It, will it get us kicked out of the room if we talk about it? Um, how do you see this developing in the future? And also, do you see this becoming, at some point, more mainstream acceptable? Maybe we'll start with you, Vance. Um, I think, yes, it will become more acceptable. But I think the important thing is, is um, words can divide just as frequently and more powerfully than they can unite. And I've been very conscious of that. And still in the world, even with myself, when I talk to myself, which is often... Um, but certainly when I talk to other people, I tend to translate. Um, I, I, I don't talk very often to people about beings or about allies. I, I use the word ally a lot because I try to find words that will make people think without causing them to react or um, have, a, have an automatic box to put something in. Um, this is my style. And, and I find that the world I work in, it, it's all about building bridges. And so I'm very careful. I use the word spirit occasionally in more of a generic sense. Um, or I use the words... Um, uh, the value-oriented words like honesty and integrity and love. Uh, I'll use these kind of words in order to elicit and create a certain environment. And that, that to me is really adequate. Um, to go further than that, I wait until people ask me. And I, 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 so then I, I try to respond to people that, that, that with whom there's been a resonance created or, or, or have something happening inside of themselves. I, I don't take that step and put it out there first as a rule. I seek words that um, have resonance uh, without being categorized necessarily as spiritual or metaphysical. Yeah, thank you. Um, Timothy, how do you, see, how do you see this kind of work developing in the future and what kind of applications might you see? Um, well, I, right now, um, what I do is I travel around the country for Lorien and do workshops. And so I'm teaching people how to, basically um, what we'll be sharing at the con conference is um, we've applied this, these particular techniques that we've you know, learned in this work um, to international conferences, like you know, wild congresses. 
and also in Mali, which is one of the most, you know, considered by the UN to be the most dangerous assignment for their people in the world. And it's worked. And so, you know, we've, we've beta tested it and it's the real deal. And so what I go about doing when I go around teaching people and working with people is teaching them that, you know, we've applied this in these um, extreme situations, but you can use this for your own home. You can use this for your place where you work and you don't have to be overt about it. You can, like Vance says, you can be just, just your actual presence can be, um, can make a change. Um, and so like I applied with, you know, the, the store that I was working in, um, you know, and ultimately I taught some classes here and like, I probably had 10 people from the store that came into my classes and it wasn't like I was trying to recruit them. It was just like, they came up to me and we started a dialogue and then things, you know, developed from there. Like Vance said, when they start asking you questions, that's when you follow up on that. And so I see this as really, um, tremendous potential, um, on a worldwide basis. You know, I mean that, um, this is stuff that can be applied to people no matter where they are in situations that they're dealing with. And right now this is what people need because, you know, there's extreme um, stress. There's a lot of anxiety in the world about the world situation, climate change, all of that. And this gives you a way to basically address it um, and develop your own strength of your own sovereignty and ways to, um, be a force in the world that's centering and calming and um and having an effect so that's why i see it being applied yeah i'll just add a comment if, if, if you don't mind um uh i don't see any other way through the environmental crises that's happening other than a stronger more obvious co-creation with nature right and that could be in any in, in in any type of way it can be just through love it can be through some of the beings that timothy and i work with or this council that i am part of and kind of an internal council that has been ha helping me for years which i don't talk about very much so there can be many ways but i, I simply do not see any other way of, of solving, of creating, of moving through to the other side of the state of the, of the world's environment and the world's society, other than this type of understanding becoming more prevalent in the appropriate way. And I don't mean by what words, I mean by heart and by feeling and by intention. Mm -hmm. Can you say anything about how you see that happening? How it would come about? Well, human beings tend to react when they're backed into a corner. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there's a very uh, cr creative aspect to crises. Y you know, the whole crises opportunity deal that we all know about. And I've been working in China so much it's on my mind all the time. Uh, yeah, no, I, I think there's tough, tough times. And I think those tough times are gonna draw out some, some of our higher reactions. Um, otherwise, people don't wanna change, <laughs> really. And they have a lot on, they're raising families, they're stressed, they're earning money. Something's gotta get their attention. Um, so I think there's going to be some attention grabbing moments in the future. I would agree with that. Yeah, I think that, um, um, basically the focus of the work that I'm doing is, and the Laurian's doing is we're trying to, you know, in, a, in other words, there probably is going to be some challenges and, 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 um, crises like Vance is talking about, but how those are addressed and how extreme those are depends on how we react. And so we're trying to do just like preventative medicine, where in a sense we're trying to do um, um, preventative action where you get, um, a, you're where people are, humanity is able to address these issues and these changes in a more flowing and, um, you know, less stressful way. 
and whether that happens, I don't know, but we're doing the best we can to um, basically facilitate that. Thank you both so much. Uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing you at the, the conference this September. Great. Yeah. And, uh, and thanks for all the work you're doing. Okay, well, I'm going to do my best to be there. It's on my calendar. We've just gotten this approval in China that we've waited for for two and a half years. So my life is accelerating quite a bit now, but I'm going to 99% be there. But the good news is if I'm, if I'm not, you've got the real deal in uh, Mr. Timothy, okay? <laughs>